picking up, I think we left off with Canto 7. I'd love to hear we got it farther than that, but I'm pretty sure my notes tell me we didn't. Uh, just real brief, I mean, there's just a few things in here I want to um, look at. Starting with 25... going down to about 47 or so. Because the unborn first of men would bear no curb for his own good on power of will, damning himself, he damned all born to him. Talking about Adam and original sin. And this idea of all humanity being damned in Adam's choice, as I said, the notion of original sin. This idea, as it's known in the West, comes from St. Augustine, who we'll see later on. Um, we probably won't actually get there, but you'll see it later on. In the um, vision of the celestial rose. Okay, Augustine's up there among the, the greater of the saints and such. Augustine essentially taught original sin is passed on through sex. Okay? So that in the medieval church, that is, it's passed on genetically, let's say. In the medieval church, however, it became so messed up that the church taught that the act of sexual intercourse was sinful, even within marriage. Okay? So it said... You have to procreate, that is, if you're married, yes, you must have sex, you must produce children, but you shouldn't enjoy it. You know, two kind of disparate positions. So that when Chaucer creates the Canterbury Tales, if you've never read Canterbury Tales, take the course that's offered once in a blue moon um, on Chaucer, and read The Wife of Bath's prologue. Because the Wife of Bath's prologue is entirely about um, women and the proper relationships between men and women. She's been married five times. The guy she's now with isn't her husband, etc. She's kind of modeled on the Samaritan woman at the well in the Gospels, etc. Okay? And the reason she gets married so much is because she tells us she likes sex. Okay? So, all damned born to him. The human race, because of this, lay sick. Great error deepening down the centuries until it pleased the Logos to descend to where our nature long abandoned its maker was made one as person with him. So, notice what Dante's doing here. At first he says, everybody was damned because of this. But then he says human nature, because of this, because of what's kind of collectively called the fall, became sick. Okay? In the eastern half of Christendom, let's say at this point, the eastern church, the eastern church has no notion of original sin. They don't have that phrase. They have the phrase ancestral sin. The sin of the first ancestor. Because the way the eastern church and the early fathers of the church understand this is that this, Augustine's notion, it's a judicial problem. Adam sinned. God got pissed off as judge. Therefore, somebody has to do something to unpiss off God. To satisfy, satisfy God's legal requirements. Okay? So you hear a lot of language in the Middle Ages and later about Christ's, Christ's death being a propitiation, that is, a satisfaction for God's judgment. The Eastern Church, the early church fathers, however, call this ancestral sin. And what they mean about it, what they suggest, is what Adam did is he, through his fall, merely introduced death. That is, the big problem isn't judicial. The big problem is this. 
It's health. Sin is illness. And therefore, what needed to be done to fix the illness was somebody not ill needed to bring health to the rest of humanity. Christ. Okay? So, to where our nature long abandoning its maker was made one as person with him, talking about Christ, etc. This nature with its maker at once at one, once was without addition pure and good. That is, back before the fall, when Adam was by himself, his nature was at one with God. He was, everything was fine, everything was good but then was banished of its own accord from paradise. Why? Because of itself it turned aside from its own life, from truth, its proper road. Because what did Adam do? Know ye not, you shall be as gods. That's what Satan says, okay, to Eve. When you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, okay, there's truth to that statement, and there's falsehood to that statement. The truth to that statement is, know you not, do you not know, you shall be, shall be, future tense. You will be like God. You will be as gods. David in the Psalms refers to saved humanity, per se, as know you not that you are gods, he says. Okay? So what Dante is, let me go back for a second to say, that's the truth part. The false part is when you eat from the tree. I was telling my first class, you know, when you swear the whole truth and nothing but the truth, what does that mean if you're in a court of law? It means everything you say has got to be true. If you shade just a little bit of it, like you're 99% true, what does that do? It makes it all false. It makes it all false. You take a multiple test, multiple choice test, okay? Hopefully your professor tells you if there is any part of the statement or a true false test, if there is any part of the statement that is not true, what? Mark it as false, okay? So the part that was false, when you eat of this, the part that was true, you are to be as God's. Talked about it the other day. The idea was image likeness to grow from the image into the likeness. Okay? So, Adam didn't grow into the likeness of God. He turned away from that. Therefore, the sentence, therefore, that the cross imposed, if measured by the nature thus assumed, was just and true. No pain was ever more. Well, what's the sentence that the cross imposed? Only somebody perfect could reunite humanity with divinity. Okay. Saint Aga uh, not St. Augustine, St. Athanasius the Great, 4th uh, century, um, Pope of Alexandria, deacon later on, patriarch of Alexandria, Alexandria, said God became man so that man might become God. Okay. And he means that God took on human flesh so that human flesh could be raised to divinity. So, thus from this self same act flowed different things, that is, from Christ. One death delighted both the Jews and God. At this earth trembled, heaven opened wide. Jesus did what? Made a road, essentially. Okay? Um, so, Dante asks, supposedly, this is the speaker saying, I know what you're thinking. Why this way alone? That is, why didn't God come up with a better way? Why'd somebody have to die, in other words? Okay? And the speaker says that ordinance lies in tune, unseen by anyone whose mind as yet is immature, untempered by love's flame. Okay? He's going to go on. Dante's going to go on. In several points, he's going to say, essentially, the questions that you are asking cannot be comprehended by human mind. It's kind of hidden mysteriously in the will of God, so to speak. Um, 
So he says, it was right for God, line 103, that God by his own means should bring us back to fullness in our lives. By one way, or I'd say by both at once. So notice what he's just said. This, whichever one of these you want to say, Adam does this. Adam screws up. Dante, echoing classical Christian thought, says, God, by his own means, fixes the problem. Okay? But since an act will please the agent more, the more it represents to view the heart of generosity from which it flowed, so too that holy generosity which stamps the universe chose happily in all his ways to raise you up once more. What's he getting at when he's talking about generosity? The notion of love that is going to permeate the last several um, cantos of this book. Okay? So he's saying it was God's divine generosity, his divine love, that did what? What's it put, how he put it? To please the agent, God, to please himself more, the more it, an act, represents to view the heart of generosity from which it flowed. It pleased God more to be the one to achieve this. Rather than merely raising someone up from down there, could God have done it another way? Dante's theoretically saying, yeah, sure. But this is the way he chose to bring himself more glory, okay? Um, let's skip the rest of that. Let's see here. Canto eight. Um, skip Canto eight. Let's see here. Canto nine. got things highlighted, but I want to move on. Um, he really starts, for the first time in Paradiso, in Canto 9, um, towards the end of it. He really starts for the first time, what's the word I want to use? Not ridiculing, chastising. The Teachers of the church, popes, cardinals, archbishops, etc. Beginning with line 133. The gospels and the teachers of the church are for sheer greed abandoned. Okay. Turn the syntax around. The gospels are abandoned for sheer greed. Okay. Or the gospels and the teachers of the church. What does it mean, teachers of the church? The early church fathers. Abandoned by whom? By the Pope and his followers. Decretals, their margins show as much, are all one reads. That is, exclamations or declarations from the Pope. The Pope and Cardinals are set on that. Their thoughts will never turn to Nazareth, where Gabriel once opened angel wings. Okay, now, Dante is saying here, the Pope doesn't give a fig for... Christ, the Gospels, the teachings of the church. The Vatican and other parts of Rome, which chosen well, have been the burial ground for all who followed Peter as his troop. What? Shall soon be free of this adultery. That's a, that's a prophecy. Okay? You're also going to see in the last 23 books, the majority of this um, portion, a variety of prophecies. Prophecies about Dante, prophecies about Italy, prophecies about the church. Okay, so Canto 10, looking within his son through that self same or through that same love, turn it on, yeah. through that same love that each breathes out eternally with each, the first and threefold worth beyond all words formed all that spins through intellect or space in such clear order can never be that we in wonder fail to taste them there. All that is to say, God created everything and if we're aware and observant, we will perceive him in his creation. Lift up your eyes then, reader. Dante is addressing his reader. Okay. Who is, who's the first level of reader that Dante is implying? 
that he's directing this to. Who does he mean to read this as he's writing it? Church. Is it the church? Is it fellow Florentines? I think it's his people, first and foremost. That's the first level. Contemporaries of his. Okay. After that, maybe, other Christians within the church, probably other Italian Christians within the church, and then get a little broader and go all the way out to us 700 years later. Okay. Lift up your eyes then, reader, and along with me, notice, standing beside me is what the, the image creates. So we participate with Dante as he describes this. Along with me, look to those wheels directed to that part where motions yearly and diurnal clash. And there in trance, begin to view the skill the master demonstrates. Within himself, he loves it so, his looking never leaves. Skip a few lines. Line 22. Now, reader, sit there at your lecture bench. And if you want not tedium but joy, continue thinking of the sip you've had. All right? Think of the little bit that you've tasted so far. And I've laid it out. Now feed on it yourself. The theme of which I am made to be scribed drags in its own direction all my thoughts. Notice what Dante has just suggested. He's not the writer. He's the scribe. He's merely copying what he's told to write. That's what a scribe does. Okay. A scribe is a copyist. So he says, line 34, um, conjoined with Aries, and with him I was there, but no more knew of making that ascent than anyone will know a thought before it first appears. How do you know a thought before you have the thought? You don't. So that's what he's saying. Suddenly, I was there. It's she, Beatrice, who sees the way from good to better still, so suddenly her actions aren't stretched out in passing time. So he says, you know, I could try, line 43, to, to call on my training, my art or wit, no words. No words can make me create this image. Belief, though, may conceive it. Eyes still long. Belief, he says, might create this conception, might create this image. In us, imagination is too mean for such great heights. And that's no miracle, for no eye ever went beyond the sun. What's he getting at? That there are things beyond our imagination. There are things beyond our ability to conceive. He's telling us, what I am describing for you is beyond human conception. So the imagery he's going to use is just that. It's imagery to convey. It is not a Polaroid of what he actually saw, right? Because he's going to give us all kinds of images. And we're going to get to the very last part of the very last canto, and he's going to say, in all language left me. When he sees the final vision of God himself. So Beatrice says, um, I want to do that. Give thanks to God, she says. Give thanks to the hymn, the son of all the angels, and grace he's raised you to this son of sense. No mortal heart was ever so well fed to give itself devoutly to its God, so swiftly with such gratitude and joy, as now to hear her words ring, I became. I set my love so wholly on that son that he in oblivion eclipsed even Beatrice. Okay? Which doesn't bother her. Why? What is her whole point? Why is Beatrice here? Why did she show up in hell? To bring Dante to this point and leave him? To get him all the way. She's going to take him all the way to Canto 30. Then she's going to leave. Okay? But she's not going to completely leave. She's going to go kind of off in the distance and he's going to see her. She's still going to draw him forth, but it's no longer um, Beatrice by his side. Um... 
Canto 11, she talks about being a mirror. Line 19. A mirror to the radiance of everlasting light. Okay, so how does a mirror work? It reflects. Okay. So she's not a mirror that Dante looks at and sees himself. She's like a mirror turned askew. And he sees in her the light that shines on her. Okay. In other words, God. She says, as I am here, line 19, a mirror to the radiance of everlasting light, so looking back, I grasp in that the wherefore of your doubts, of your thoughts. You have your doubts. You want me to define with sharper and more open explanations the words I uttered earlier, where all grow fat and where I said no second ever grows. So we need to make distinctions to that. And what does she then go on and do? She talks about two founders of monastic orders. Okay, St. Francis of Assisi, founder of the Franciscans, and St. Dominic, founder of the Dominicans. That's what she's talking about in essentially lines 28 through 42 or so. Okay, And then she keeps talking about other, um, about the monastic orders, and she mentions line 79, another founder of monastics, St. Bernard, okay? Not the dog. Uh, skip the rest of that. St. Dominic is introduced at the, uh, by name, page 121, and then they call, refer to Dominic again, Canto 12, Line 70 and following, we're going to skip a bunch, skip all of 13. Um, Canto 14, Thomas Aquinas stops talking, because he's been talking in 13 and 14, and Beatrice says, um, he's got another question, that is Dante, the man still needs, line 10, although he does not say, not even thinking it yet, she says, but I know what's in his mind. Tell him that light in which, as what you are, your being in its substance is in flower. Will that remain eternally with you? That is, will you, Thomas, be eternally as bright as you are now? Okay. Line 28. Um, Dante is speaking. And says, the one and two and three, who always lives and always reign in three and two and one, uncircumscribed and circumscribing all, that is, the Trinity, had three times now been lauded in all the songs of every spirit there, etc. Line 37. As long as this great festival of paradise goes on, so too our love, our love, will cast these robes in rays around us all. So, as long as we're in this paradise of heaven, as long we will wear these robes of light. Well, how long will that be? Eternity. That brightness follows from their inward fire, that fire from vision. The inward fire, it's the fire of God. The vision is from their vision of God. Their sight extends as far as each beyond their due has grace. But when the glorious and sacred flesh is clothing us once more, that is... The resurrection. Because everybody that Dante meets in heaven, their bodies are still rotting down on earth. With one exception. Right. Well, two, I guess. Mary and Jesus. He doesn't actually meet Jesus. He just kind of sees him from a distance. He sees Mary also from a distance, though she does address him. But when the glorious and sacred flesh is clothing us once more, our person then will be complete and whole, more pleasing still. In other words, it's like we will have even greater light. For then, whatever has been granted us by utmost good, a free and gracious light will increase. Whatever God has granted us will be even more. Why? Because as of now, the soul that is speaking is incomplete. Why? God breathed into the man that he formed of the dust of the ground, Adam. Okay. Before God breathed into that 
dust of the ground formed in the likeness of man, what was that dust in the ground of the ground formed in the likeness of man? Just a body. God breathed into it, gave it life, and it became what? A living soul. Souls without bodies aren't complete. Bodies without souls aren't complete. The two are meant to be together. Okay? So, hence, as must be, our seeing will increase. Increasing to the fire that vision lights, the ray increasing that proceeds from that. In other words, our ability to see will become even better. Why? Because now they see kind of merely intellectually. Then they will see intellectually and with their eyes. The eyes, however, will be what? Resurrected, redeemed, perfected eyes. They'll be the eyes Adam should have developed, not by eating of the tree of life, but by growing into the likeness of God. Right? Um, they go up, they rise up to the next circle, plane, sphere, okay, through Mars, and we're told, lines 103 and following, there are, these are those who take the cross and follow Christ, and who were uh, heroes of the faith, so to speak. Canto 15, if my note is right, I don't think I moved that from something else. No, Cantos 15 through 17, Dante's, got to make sure I understand what my note says. I think it's his great-great-grandfather, Cacciaguda, C-A-C-C-I-A-G-U-I-D-A, -C -C -I speaks. Right? So now it becomes real personal. This is family speaking to him. Um, let's see here. Lines one through three. Goodwill, parentheses, long parenthetical statement, to which the love that breathes aright will always in its distillation flow, as does cupidity to wickedness. Okay, so what does that mean? Goodwill. It's not good will do something. It's goodwill, to which the love that breathes the right, properly, appropriately, will always in its distillation flow. So the love that breathes the light will in its distillation flow. How do you distill love? If it's distilled, what does it become? Distilled water is what? Pure. Okay. So love, distilled, gets purer and purer and purer. So, goodwill, we're told, brought silence to that sweetly sounding lyre and stilled the motion of its holy strings. How can it be that those true beings there whose choir of silence urged me on to pray will ever turn deaf ears to honest prayer? How will they not answer honest prayer? Line 10, it's only right that all know endless grief who, loving only things that can't endure, steal from themselves eternally true love. They remove themselves eternally true love. Why? Because what did they love? All those damned in hell from the second circle down, not those in limbo, not those who didn't know, but everybody else. Something other than true love. Because what is true love? God, the highest good. Okay? The only love. So, Ketchaguda goes on and he talks um, about family, essentially, through 15 through 17. Canto 16, kind of interesting, begins with the idea of nobility. And what is true nobility? Nobility of blood, that whim of ours. What's he mean? Have any of you read My Last Duchess by, Thomas, by um, Browning? Okay. What does the duke in My Last Duchess, what is one of the reasons 
he kills his former wife. He says, she laughed at everything. She was pleased by everything as if my gift of a 900 years old name was equal to a bowl of cherries. Okay. What's he holding on to? Family heritage. All right. Chaucer deals with the same issue in The Wife of Bath's Tale. Not the prologue, the tale, okay? which is about what is real honor? What is real nobility? Because knights at the time, a lot of knights at the time, within the context of the tale at least, say true nobility is what? Who you're related to. What does it mean to be nobility in London today? Yeah. <laughs> Your relationships to, ultimately, the queen. Okay. We don't have, we supposedly don't have nobility in the United States. But we do. We have our own royal families. Kennedys. Bushes, kind of to an extent. The Adamses. Father-son presidents. Bushes, father-son presidents. Who knows if there will be another one. Some say the Clintons, okay? But the Clintons aren't an old established family like the Kennedys and the Bushes are. Nobility of blood, that whim of ours. What's Kachiguda going to get at? What is true nobility? Always. Yes. Right behavior. It's noble actions. Okay? This is an issue J.K. Rowling brings up in the Harry Potter novels. Because you have, as a major force in the Harry Potter novels, the purebloods. They're talking about this idea of nobility of blood. And then you have a bunch of characters who are not purebloods. They're mixed bloods. They're mudbloods, some of them are even called. Who what? Shown true nobility by how they behave, how they treat others. Okay? So, line seven. You are, of course, talking about nobility of blood, a mantle that soon shrinks. So if you're not patched up from day to day, time with its pinking shears will circle you. Because what happens with the clothes you wear? The longer you wear them, they wear out. They have to be fixed. They have to be darned. So if you're not patched up from day to day, time with its pinking shields will circle you. So with that thou that ancient Romans used, its clan, though, doesn't keep the usage up. The words began once more to come from me. At this, Beatrice, some way away, smiled in the manner of the one who coughed to mark the first mistake of Guinevere. And look at your footnote, because there's a footnote about how Guinevere kind of was caught up in that notion of nobility. Okay? So, Kachiguda goes on. Canto 17. Um, Beatrice speaks to him, to Dante, and says, line 31. Hold on a second. No, this is Dante replying to, to um, Beatrice. You so on high yourself that you see well, skipping the parenthetical, contingencies before they come to be, your eyes set wondering on the point at which all times are present time. You so on high yourself. What he means there is you are raised so high that you what? You see contingencies before they come to be. What does he mean contingencies? Things that will be. Okay. Dante's talking about kind of seeing life like this. Linearly, Beatrice is so high up here, she sees what? She sees the future, so to speak. All right? So he says, while I was in Virgil's company, he spoke to me in grave and weighty words about my future life. So I should feel four square against the blows that were to come. When I was with Virgil, he warned me, in other words. He prophesied 
So I could do what? So I could four square myself, that is, get ready for what life was coming to offer. Therefore, he says, I'd willingly receive sure words that told what fortune now draws near to me. Those arrows that we know will come fly slower. And the translator, I think, has got to be channeling, you know, Hamlet about the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. The problems that we know are coming will do what, he says? Fly slower. We're more prepared for those. I said all this to that same light that first had spoken out to me and thus confessed as Beatrice wished what I desired. Okay? So Beatrice had spoken just before Dante, but Dante is addressing Kachiguda still, his great-great-grandfather. So he says that father love now gave his reply, line 37, contingency whose fear does not extend beyond the margins of your earthly things is framed and painted in eternal sight. What does he mean? Well, here's earth, okay? Here's the orbit of the moon or the sphere of the moon. Everything between earth and the orbit of the moon is contingent, or that's where contingency, mutability, impermanence rules. But what Kachiguda is saying is from out here, we can see every contingency. We can see what is going to happen down here, not what has happened, what is going to happen. So he's going to say, Dante, hold on to your seat, because I'm going to tell you about what's going to happen. You'll leave, Florence, line 48. Well, when Dante has written this, he's already out of Florence. Okay? But he's writing it as though he's still there, kind of. You'll leave behind all you hold most dear. In other words, Dante, you're going to become an exile. Now, again, Dante's writing this in exile. And he tells us the rest of the canto about problems that Dante is going to suffer and that Florence is going to suffer. So Dante says, line, line 109, well, 106, I see now clearly, Father, how the years spur down on me, how the blow they mean to strike is worse to those who fleeing flinch aside. It's better than I arm myself with foresight. So that so if that dearest place is snatched away, my verses do not lose me all the rest. Down through the world of endless bitterness around the mountain where my ladies look, raised me so I could reach its lovely peak, that is, when I was wandering through the dark wood. Then through these heavenly spheres, that is where Beatrice has led him, from light to light I've learned of things which, if I now repeat, will leave in many mouths an acid taste. In other words, you know, if I were to really tell everybody everything I saw here, a lot of people are going to be really angry. A lot of people like, oh, I don't know whom. Who does he repeatedly go after? Boniface the Eighth, Pope of Rome. Okay? I mean, repeatedly. Dante's Catholic. If you're Catholic, you don't want to piss off the Pope. Because what can the Pope do? Imagine this is a candle. Excommunicate. Means you're left out of the church. Okay? Where do the excommunicates arrive in purgatory if they make it that far? The anti-purgatory. The shore. And they have to go around and around there a certain number of times according to how long they live before they actually can even get up to the first level and such. So Dante's saying, you know, it could be pretty dangerous for me if I were to tell everything I see here. Yes, Carlton. So if they're excommunicated, though, in that point, I thought the only thing that could get them up higher was people's prayers for them to be abstained. But if they're excommunicated, is anyone even praying for them? Well, I'm sure some will. Even though the church says... You're not supposed to have any contact with this person, blah, 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 blah. Right. Yeah. Family members probably are going to say, yeah, we'll still. Okay. Who else? Well, people in 
heaven are still praying. I mean, that's Mary's kind of whole purpose, intercessor. She's called the mediatrix in both the Catholic and Orthodox churches. Right? So he says, and if I prove a timid friend to truth, I shall, I fear, forego my life among those souls who count as ancient our own time. So here's, here's the rock and the hard place he's between. If I tell the truth, there are going to be a lot of angry people at me. If I don't tell the truth, he'll forego my life among those souls who will count as ancient our own time. He means I'll forego heaven. So tell the truth, suffer here. Don't tell the truth, suffer there. Sound like a previous problem that we've seen with another character? Antigone? Either please the king here, suffer down there, please the gods down there, suffer under the king here. The light in which the treasure I found there was smiling still, first blazed in coruscations, and says, all murky consciences who feel their own way or any other shame are bound to balk at your abrasive words. But nonetheless, all lies put clean aside. Make plain what in your vision you have seen, and let them scratch wherever they may itch. In other words, and if you trouble somebody's conscience, that's their problem. For if at first your voice tastes odious, notice, your voice not sounds odious, tastes odious. The idea is that we ingest these things. They become part of us. And maybe the ingesting at first doesn't taste all that pleasant. For if at first your voice tastes odious, still it will offer, as digestion works, life-giving nutriment to those who eat. What does he mean? Real world example. Some of you might have, you know, while reading this thought, my God, this is dull and boring. Okay? Dante, through the mouth of Kachaguda, is saying, but maybe as this digests in you, not between now and December 16th, the end of the semester, but between now and your 30th, 40th, 50th birthdays, as this just sits in the back of your mind, working on you, maybe <clears throat> it will do what? Give life-giving nutriment. That's Dante's point. He's hoping his book will be life-changing, life-altering, just as eating is life-changing and life altering. I'll bet everybody in this room has at one time or another eaten something that did not agree with you. And I'll bet at other times you've eaten something that has really agreed with you. Okay? The words you shout will be like blasts of wind that strike the very summit of the trees, and this will bring no small degree of fame. In other words, he's saying, Dante, you are going to be famous. For you've been shown in all these circling wheels around the mountain, purgatory, in the sorrowing veil, hell, only those souls whose fame is widely known. In other words, you've only met whom? In hell, in purgatory, and he's going to in the rest of the time in paradise. You've only met famous people. Dante hasn't outed, you know, Fred, the janitor, for having stolen from the church. Okay? He's only done what? He's only picked on the Weinsteins, the Lowers, the Trumps, the Pope Francis's, not putting Pope Francis, you know, with the other three. But he's essentially saying, you've only seen what? Those who can essentially take it because why? They're already public figures. 
Since those who hear you speak will never pause or give belief to any instances whose family roots are hidden or unknown, nor demonstrations that remain obscure. In other words, nobody's going to believe this if you only refer to Fred the janitor. Why? Go back to Aristotle. What do we see in tragedy? Who should the tragic hero be? Someone a little bit above our station who has done what? Risen to a great height. Okay? Because we don't want to go see a life about your neighbor. Because it's, you know your neighbor. It's boring. There's, there's nothing good about that. All right? So, Canto 18. They go on up to the fifth sphere. And Dante tells us, line 13, My heart, in awe now looking back at her, was free of all desires, save that alone. As long, at least, as eternal pleasure, shining in Beatrice's lovely eyes, made me, in its reflected view, content. This is the only desire he still has, that he could see in Beatrice's eyes eternal pleasure. And she smiles at him, says, turn around, don't look at me, turn around, pay heed to him. Heaven is found not only in my eyes. Okay. She's kind of starting to, let's say, wean Dante off of her. Kind of like, Dante, you got you to get ready for the real thing. So they make their way up to, as I said, the fifth circle. And she says, excuse me, he says, Who the he is at this point. Line 28. Uh, actually, pick up a 31. Here are spirits of the blessed who there below won such renown before they reached these spheres, spheres that any muse which sang, sang of them would thrive. These are the Christian heroes of the past. For example, Joshua. Christian before Christ. Why? Because he looked forward to the coming of Christ. Judas Maccabeus, line 40. Roland Charlemagne. Okay, bunch of other guys from the Middle Ages. Dante turns, looks at Beatrice, and we're told. He looks at her, and as we recognize, line 58, from day to day that we in doing good have now advanced when doing good, we feel a greater, greater joy. Okay. To unpack that, as we recognize from day to day that we in doing good have now advanced when Doing good, we feel a greater joy. He's saying, as we do more and more good, we experience a greater joy at doing good. And he's essentially saying, the more good we do, the easier it becomes. So, with the eyes I circled round, I knew the arc through which we swung had grown, seeing that miracle yet more adorned. They go from the fifth to the sixth. I saw in that great torch of Jupiter, the scintillations of a love there. Okay? And we get these words. Oh, should I put that up? We're running out of time. Dante sees a bunch of spirits that kind of form these letters. And then he says, line 88, In five times seven vowels and consonants, it fashioned this to play, and I took note of all these parts as they appeared to me. Up real quick, uh, doc cam. Show it to class. Put on projector. On. Is it coming on? No. Screen. Down. No disc. I don't want a disc. I want the... 
There we go. So, line 88, he says, in five times seven vowels and consonants that fashion this display, and I took note of all these parts as they appeared to me. Um, Dinagita justitiam, these first main verb and noun of all that bright design, qui judicatus teram. And this is something about seeking peace and justice throughout all the world, Paradiso 18. Love justice, you rulers of the earth, is what that Latin means, okay? And he says, and then all these lights gathered on the, follow, on the last M, okay? This is a Gothic M, as it would appear, okay? So the stars make this form. And then what happens? On the M's peak, the souls are lighting from above on the top of the M, change it to as follows. So souls start lining up here. Then he says, there are the elven eagles back in Christ. The souls start to make this form, okay? So it's still an M, but now it's got the eagle's crest. And they keep changing until we see this form take shape. Why? Because that's the sign of the empire. And once, line 106, each rested at its proper point, I saw distinctly shown in golden fire the image of an eagle's head and neck. He who paints there needs none to guide his hand. He is the guide. From him we recognize, derives the power that forms in our nest, etc., etc. So what's his point? Okay, go back to what I said the Latin meant. Love justice, you rulers of the earth. Dante's getting at this idea that justice, the empire, the Holy Roman Empire, have as their model, okay, or the, the indwelling demon of them, for each of them, the justice of God. And what he's getting at in this canto, and I think in the next, is this idea that every form of justice in this world, okay, is a, let me turn all this off now, um, Every form of justice in this world, all form of rule, okay, is an inkling of real, true, final justice. Okay? It is a, an element of, it is a working towards. Does that mean there will ever be a place on this earth where there is perfect justice? No. That's his point. But every moment of justice is an inkling of a perfect justice to come. Okay? Why? Because God is ultimately just. So, Dante's kind of, he's kind of wondering how that works out. And we're told, line 31, you know the doubt uh, in Canto 19, you know the doubt as well, the old, long, hungering I suffer from. Well, the old long hungry Dante suffers from is he wants to know what about those who never hear about Christ? What about those who never get the gospel preached to them? Is it fair that they end up in hell? Do they Ill all end up in hell? All right? Line 40. The one who turned his compass it began, the voice of the eagle, okay? This is all of these souls speaking with one voice. Total agreement. The one who turned his compass round the reaches of the universe and marked within things clear and dark to view might blaze his worth upon that cosmic plan. You could not fail in doing so to leave its infinite excess as true as word. As proof of this, that being first in pride, the summit once of all creation fell, he would not wait for light, acid unripe. What does the eagle mean? Why did Satan fall? 
Why was Satan cast into hell? Because he wouldn't wait to be illumined. He wouldn't wait. He wanted what? Something now. God's justice. He thought it was justice that he received more light. Okay? So, from which it's clear that nature is less than his, and I think the his refers to both Satan's and God's. Nature is less than his, or all too shallow to contain that good which has no end and measure self by self. In other words, who are we to try to understand fully what God intends? We cannot contain, contain that infinitude. Therefore, the powers of sight that you possess, which must exist as raised from that one mind, with which all things that are brimming are, are brimming full, cannot in their nature be so great that their original should not have sight of much beyond. In other words, okay, Dante, you're created in the image of God. What does that mean? Let's say this. This is your image of God. Where is God, though? How much of can this understand? Not much. Okay? So, cannot be so great that their original should not have sight of much beyond. So, the sight, let's say, Extends to here, to here, to here, to here. But God's sight extends everywhere. It follows that the sight your world receives in sempiternal justice sinks itself threefold as deep as eyes in open sea. Look at the image. Although you see the bottom near the shore, the ocean floor you can't. In other words, you're talking about justice, Dante. How is it fair? Fairness is an issue of justice. How is it fair that? What's Dante's point? Your conception of what is fair, like looking at the ocean floor at the shore, isn't deep enough. Your conception of fair only goes this far. Whereas, as we all know, what happens as you walk farther and farther out in the ocean? Okay, not only does it get deeper, but at some point you step off what if you're on a continent? The continental shelf. Okay. This, however, is the justice or fairness of God. We see what? Little tiny bit. That's what St. Paul means by now we see but through a glass darkly. Okay? And yet it's there. Its depths can feel it being so profound. So, the speaker says, hey, you say, line 70, a man is born beside the Indus. An Indian and there is no one there who speaks of Christ or reads or writes to him. <laughs> and all he does and all he means to do as far as human... Oh, come on, you stupid thing. Wake up. Hello, wake up. Turn on the lights. Somebody move around. Lights, you stupid thing. Um, and all he does and all he means to do as far as human minds can tell is good. is good, sinless alike in living and in word. So notice, a guy grows up next to the Indus River, and he's good. Then, unbaptized beyond the faith, he dies. Where's the justice that condemns him thus? Where is his guilt if he does not believe? Well, who are you to sit there on your throne, acting the judge a thousand miles away? Eyesight is short as some mere finger span. Notice the speaker is telling Dante, who are you to say this guy gets sent to hell? Okay. You earthbound creatures, dense in thought and head, the primal will which, which of itself is good, has never from its own high good been moved, that is, 
God's will has never been moved from his goodness. It's never changed from his goodness. No, what counts as just will ring in tune with that. Think of God's will, his plan, as a bell. And his justice will what? Be completely in tune with the rest of the bell. So what does he mean? No creature good draws that will to itself, but that, its rays projecting God's goodness, does what? Causes this. In other words, that guy sitting by the Indus River, who does good, who doesn't sin, guess why he does all that? Because he's made in the image of God. Because he's in tune, the bell language, because he's in tune with God's will. And if he's in tune with God's will, then what's he doing? He's answering that. Dante doesn't come right out and say it, but he implies that pagan guy sitting by the Indus River, he's up here somewhere. Why? Because he's acted according to what? He has believed to be the best and true and right about the world. So, 103. There is in this realm none who ever rose that had no faith in Christ since or before they nailed him to the wood. Okay? But see this. Many cry out, Christ, Christ, Christ. Yet many will, come judgment, be to him less prope, proper, than are those who don't know Christ. That's Matthew 25, the parable of the last judgment. When Christ says, I'm going to divide people into the left hand, the right hand, the right hand are going to go by my right hand, the others are going to be the goats, they're going to go to hell, and there are going to be some who are going to say, hey, we prophesied in your name, we did, 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 did. he's saying, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And others are going to say, when did we feed you? When did we clothe you? When did we give you water? Inasmuch as you did it unto the least of these, you did it to me. Come into heaven prepared for you. Okay? Christians such as these, the Ethiopian will damn when souls divide between two schools. And by Ethiopian, he doesn't mean the blacks. He just means pagans. Right? Because Ethiopia at this time, Dante's mind, Dante thought Ethiopia was pagan. Interestingly enough, Dante didn't know this. Ethiopia had one of the oldest Christian civilizations in the world. Okay? It is supposedly, by the way, where the Ark of the Covenant currently resides in Ethiopia. So, Canto 20. Speak. Sorry, is it supposed because we think that think so no um, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church says okay. they have it they know exactly where it is it's not hidden That's a, uh, but they haven't revealed but they don't yeah <laughs> exactly because there's too many wackos out there that would you yeah, know yeah. Canto 20 following up on the previous conversation where the speaker said Dante so you want to know what what about the, the pagan guy who do we meet we meet six people, okay, who form the eye and the eyebrow, turn off projector, off, and the eyebrow of this eagle, okay? The eye is David, and the eyebrow is these five other people. The very first one, line 43. Then of those five, in Canto 20, I think this is, then of those five whose circle forms my brow, he who is closest to my bill's high bridge consoled the widow for her murdered son. Well, we've already heard a story about him, I think in Inferno. This is Trajan, Roman emperor who died pagan. Okay? Who one day, as he's getting ready to go out to battle, a widow came up to him and stopped him and said, what about my dead son? Won't you do something? And at first he said, I'm going to, and then he said, okay, and he stopped, okay, and he helped her. Then he dies. 
Okay, Dante alludes to it. According to the tradition of the church, both Catholic and Orthodox, Gregory the Great, the guy who wrote the hymn about this veil of tears, Gregory the Great prayed that Trajan would be brought back to life, that is, brought out of hell, so that he could accept Christ. He comes back to life. He's presented the quote-unquote gospel. He accepts. He dies again. And he goes to heaven. There's an instance of what? Somebody praying somebody out of hell, essentially. Okay? The next person, King Hezekiah, Old Testament. He's on his deathbed. He prays God, please, a little more time. God gives him 15 years. Okay? Next person, St. Constantine. Okay? Line 55. One who threw his aims, though his aims were good, he brought forth bad fruit. What's the bad fruit Constantine brought forth? United church and state. It's from Constantine that we have our church-state problem. Okay, okay. That's, you know, 325, folks. That goes back 1,700 years from today. So it's not something, you know, the current Supreme Court's going to solve that problem real easily. Okay? The next person... William, who I don't remember much about. And the last person, I mean, we're getting real pagan here. Okay. Repaeus, a Trojan from the Trojan War. Okay. Who is now counted as one of the elect. So, line 100. The first life and the fifth life that marked this brow caused you to wonder. Why? Well, they left their bodies contra, against your belief, as Christian souls, not Gentiles, firm in faith that his feet paced to past or coming pain. Trajan from hell, from where to exercise goodwill, no soul returns, came back to bone. This mercy granted him for living hope. Okay. And Repaeus, well, we're told, the other, by that grace which drops like, drops like dew, its source so deep that no created eye can ever penetrate the primal wave, sets all its love. God therefore opened Rephaeus' eyes, grace upon grace, to when, he be to when we'd be redeemed. That is, before he died, God showed this ancient Trojan around 1200 B.C. You know, a newsreel. Meanwhile... Far in the future, this guy is going to come in. And, and he said, well, yeah, that's kind of what I've been looking forward to. That's what I believe. And he dies and goes the other place. Those three pure dona, the ladies, from the right-hand wheel, which you once saw, were as his, Rephaeus' baptism. Who are they? Faith, hope, and love. So, you mortals, line 133, in your judgments, show restraint. And I think this is Dante talking to his people. 14th century Italy. For even we who look on God do not yet know who all the chosen are. So, they go on up to the seventh heaven, Saturn, contemplation. It's the virtue of temperance. This is where all the monks and ascetics are. In Canto 22, we see Benedict of Nursia, or Nursa as he's sometimes called. This is the founder of the Benedictines who created a rule of, of faith or order that all the Benedictines were supposed to follow. Okay? Benedict is the founder of a Western monasticism, 5th century. All right? And then we see others after Benedict. Macario is Macarius, probably, your book tells you it's Macarius the Younger, who's the founder of Eastern monasticism. Your editor's wrong. Macarius is not the founder of Eastern monasticism. That belongs to a guy named Anthony the Great, who is the first monk, okay, before Macarius. So, Dante says, line 58, Therefore I pray, do, Father, make me sure that I may come to such, take such grace that I might see your face and cover it as you are. 
And so he says, your high desire will be fulfilled within the final sphere. Okay. You will see me as I really am, Canto 33. All our desiring is perfected there. Perfected doesn't mean it's, it's completed. It means it reaches its fulfillment. Well, what is that? The vision of God. It's in the vision of God that all desires are met. For that is no mere place, line 67. It has no pole. Our ladder rising spines across to that and therefore steals and flight apart. It steals and flight away from view. He says, that's the ladder that Jacob saw extending to heaven. My rule remains a waste, line 74, of all the vellum that it's copied on. Why? Because he's saying the Benedictines today don't do what I taught. And he's going to really unload on the church. The walls that once encircled abbey grounds are turned to dens and lairs. Monastic cowls are bursting sacks, stuffed full with rotten flour. Skip a few lines. Everything the church is there to guard belongs to those who ask it in God's name. It is not meant for kinsmen. Because when Dante was writing, nepotism was rife in the church. Cardinals making their sons bishops. This is at the time where the church, the Catholic church had already said bishops, priests, cardinals can't marry. Therefore, obviously, then, they also should not be having sons. Okay? <laughs> kind of think. Peter began, no silver, no gold. Line 88. Remember the guy named Simon who came to Peter and said, Hey, how, how much can I buy this Holy Spirit for? And Peter said, He's not for sale. <laughs> That's where the word simony comes from. The buying and selling of church offices. As I did too, says St. Benedict with fasting and with prayers, and Francis. But if you look where each of these began, and then consider where their track has won, run, you'll see the white original turned dark. All right? So, Dante turns to Beatrice, line 118 and following, and she says, you're so close, man. Line 124. You are so close to your salvation here that you must keep the light within your eye cute and clear. And he turns and looks around, because she tells him, look how far you've come, Dante. Okay, he's now in the seventh sphere. And so when she says, turn and look how far you've come, she tells him to look down towards earth. And he can. He can see clearly through each sphere, and he can see earth clearly. And probably the longer and longer and longer and longer he looked, the more earth would kind of become Magnify closer and closer, and he would see everything, and then he would see down into hell and such. And he smiled to find how small and cheap it seemed. 136. I thoroughly approve as best the thought that earth is least. See, there's the idea that in the Middle Ages, because earth was seen as being at the center of the universe, that therefore is the most important thing. It's just the opposite. It's the smallest. Yes. In their conception, it's the center, okay? But what else does that mean? All the weight of everything else bears down upon it. That's why Satan, down there at the lowest circle of hell, he bears the weight of the universe on his shoulders, cramming him down in that hole, okay? Therefore, 137, those then who set their minds on other things are known as right and able. Okay, we're going to skip a bunch. Um, 23, he gets up. He sees the Empyrean. He hears Gabriel. Okay. And Dante's got to get his eyes adjusted so that he can really see what's going to come later. Okay. He meets Peter, James, and John. He hears Peter speak. He hears James speak. He sees John the Beloved. Okay. Line 121. And when he does, he looks at John really closely because he's thinking, is that a body? Because Christ said, there are some who will not die before they see me come in my kingdom. So that some of the disciples said afterwards, John wasn't going to die. Well, Christ was talking there, probably, most people believe, 
about the apocalypse, the book of Revelation, that John would see him in that revelation, okay? Dante, John is saying, you think my body, my body's rotten down there, okay? So, he goes on up, line, uh, page 446, line 103, he talks to Adam. Adam says, you want to know how long I was in the garden before I fell. Line 115, my dear son, the tasting of the tree was not itself the cause of banishment, but rather our disc, our transgression of the mark. Meaning, we lost sight on the you know, hubris. Homer, excuse me, hamartia means missing the mark. What's the mark? God. He lost sight of God and focused on the tree instead. All right? So, Dante wants to know, how long were you in hell? And he essentially says about a little over 4,000 years. Okay? There's an old English Christmas carol called Adam Lay Ebounden. It's a Middle English carol. Adam Lay Ebounden, Ebounden, he says, um, or the song says, in hell, 4,000 winters long. Before Christmas, the Nativity. Okay? Canto 27. All the spirits are praising God, and we hear, line 22, He who, this is Peter speaking, He who on earth has robbed me of my place. You know, what is Peter's place on earth? Bishop of Rome. Upon you will I. Build my rock, Christ says. For upon this rock I will build my church. Bishop of Rome, first pope of Rome. Somebody else has robbed him of his place. He's talking about Boniface VIII. My place, which therefore in the sight of God's dear son stands vacant now, has made of my own burial ground a shithole, reeking of blood and pus. Dante doesn't think much for the current occupant. In this, the sod, talking about Satan, who fell from here down there takes sheer delight. That's pretty strong language, okay? 49, nor that the keys entrusted to my hand should serve as battle emblem on the flag. That is, the flag of the forces of the Vatican. Okay? What else has that flag been done? It's been used to fight other Christians. So Peter's really not happy with what's going on. Skip a bunch again. We've only got four minutes. And I at least want to get us to... Uh, skip Canto... Yeah, we could probably skip that. Canto 30. Dante, in love, turns his eyes towards Beatrice in lines 14 and 15. If all that has till this been said of her were now enclosed to form one word of praise, it would not even so fulfill my need. Why? Because now that his eyes have been opened, because he could perceive St. John, the beloved of Christ, okay, his eyes have been opened, and so it's now he sees Beatrice more as she really is. As she was, line 37, as she then was, a guide in word indeed, her work all done, she spoke again, we've left the greatest of material spheres, Rising to light, pure light of intellect, all love, the love of good and truth. In other words, he's now in and seeing the celestial image. He's seeing the he's going to see the ranks of the saved. Rising, we're told, in a thousand rows, outward and upward. And at the center of that rose is God. Okay. So he sees the tears, etc., etc. He describes the rose. Divine light pierces the universe, we're told, line 22 in Canto 31. Um, 49, line 49, Canto 31, talks about, I saw their faces swayed to caritas, love. Swayed. What does that mean? Like gentle, or like branches in a gentle breeze. They move with the breeze. What's the breeze? Blowing 
emanating from the center of heaven and going outward, like the solar wind. Love. It's God's self-expression moving outward. Okay. He turns to ask Beatrice a question, line 51. But someone else replies, she's not there. Where is she? So I can bring an end to your desire, line 65. Beatrice, move me from the place I keep. And he says, look over there. If to the highest round of that third step, you'll raise your eyes, you'll see her there. And he looks, and she smiles at him. And Dante offers a prayer to her. And then the holy patriarch says, I am Bernardo, her most faithful one. Okay. Um, Bernard of Clairvaux, I believe this is. Yeah, Bernard of Clairvaux, a contemplative, a mystic, okay, founder of the Cistercians, a true devotee of Mary. And it's Bernard of Clairvaux who, in 32 and 33, kind of gently leads Dante up to the final celestial vision. Last minute. Just look at the end. The very end. Lines 137 and following. He says, I willed myself to see what fit there was, image to circle, how this all in weird, filled in, so to speak. But mine were wings that could not rise to that. That is, I couldn't see that, save that with this my mind was stricken through by sudden lightning, bringing what it wished. That is, Completing, fulfilling the desire. All powers of high imagining here failed. But now my will and my desire were turned as wheels that move in equilibrium. They move in harmony by love that moves the sun and other stars. His will, his desire was now in harmony, in sync with what he sees at the center of paradise. Okay, Bear in mind, What's the whole purpose? Dante has told us repeatedly. So that he could go back and report. Why? So that the people of his time would, he says, find their way. So they don't have to go through what he went through in terms of seeing and experiencing the pains and sorrows of hell.